scouters, we have Gitanjali Rao. Uh, she graduated in 1994 from uh, JJ School of Arts, uh, JJ School of Fine Arts with a bachelor's degree. Uh, she uh, is an animator, illustrator, filmmaker, teacher, and theatre artist. She has made three independent films, which she directed and produced. And these three films all have won awards. Orange, the films are Orange, Printed Rainbow, and True Story. Uh, these films, uh, Printed, Printed Rainbow premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2006 and won three awards including Best Short Film. She conducts workshops and presentations and has been in various juries uh, at many international film festivals. She teaches uh, storytelling, uh, design and 2D animation across various animation schools in India. Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody and um, thank you all for coming. I can see a large audience and it feels very nice. Um, I can see it's a very lively audience and lively uh, college because I've been to quite a few and I was just telling Rohan the college seems very lively and it's really good. Because most uh, students that now I deal with are usually animation students and they are burdened by too much work and they become like, you know, really not having fun in life. <laughs> uh, it's good because I, I myself come from JJ, which is, I, I did applied art, but we had architecture also in JJ that you would all know about. But it, we were, I mean, the, the commercial art was actually the more screamy and livelier one than architecture. I remember then that architecture students in JJ were very serious. So um, now I think after a lot of years, I the difference between seriousness and being lively are, is becoming more and more apparent for me. I'm essentially an animation filmmaker. And um, I know animation is probably not something all of you are very familiar with or are probably even interested in. But uh, today I would like to sh uh, share my films with you. And uh, in in a sense, uh, since all of you over here are through various, various years involved in architecture, uh, what would be interesting for me to uh, not just show my films but even have a short discussion over my films is if you look at it from a point of view of architecture. And this is not just a one uh, dimensional view of architecture, but architecture in, in terms of how it makes a city, how it exists outside a city. Most of my films and my work is about the difference between being in a city and maybe coming from a place which is not a city. And of course, architecture space is the essential difference between uh, an urban place and a rural place. So, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are familiar with my work. I'm hoping you're not because out of the three films which I have made, two of them are on YouTube, uh, which is Printed Rainbow, and it has been seen by a lot of people. So I'm just hoping uh, there are not too many people over here in the audience who have seen the film, because then it makes sense sharing it. So, if anybody has seen my films on uh, online, could you just put up your hands? One back there. That's very hopeful. <laughs> and one out here in the front. Okay. So for you, it's going to be a little boring, but the rest of the people, I guess, will uh, see it for the first time. So I'll start with my um, with a film that I made in 2006. It's called Printed Rainbow. This was a film, uh, this was one of my first, almost my first uh, animation film made completely independently by myself. And animation essentially as a, pro as a process is drawing frame by frame in order to create movement or painting frame by frame, which is what I do. And uh, let me also tell you that my films are not really the kind of commercial animation that you would probably be seeing on screen. That is uh, what I call conventional animation, is what comes out of the Disney Studios or uh, Pixar and DreamWorks. Now Pixar and DreamWorks are doing 3D animation, but if you've seen the older Walt Disney films, they are 2D animation, and what I work in is also 2D animation. It's not something which heavily depends on uh, computers, but it is something which is really more like, I would say, embroidery. It's like painting every frame after frame to create uh, movement. 
So, I would like to start with uh, Printed Rainbow, and it's a 15 minute long film. And then maybe speak a little bit about it, show you another short excerpt, which again would be interesting because it has to do with architecture. And after that, show you my last film which I made, which is a 19 minute film. Uh, the three films are quite different from each other, so it would still uh, work. And after that, we can uh, have a, a discussion and a Q&A and all. So you can uh, rest assured that it's going to be 40, 45 minutes of film watching. Not really a lecture that I would be giving. I'm sure film watching is more enjoyable than listening to somebody. So we'll start without any delay. And then uh, as, as we open up to the Q&A, it'll be easier for me to have a discussion with what you're interested in and what you would like me to share with you. So we start with Printed Rainbow. It was made uh, about eight years back, 2006, nine, nine years back. And um, this is, uh, as you must have noticed, it's painted frame by frame. Um, it took me about three years to make the film because uh, some of the scenes are quite uh, complicated and things. So I wonder if you noticed that there was this palace sequence which happens in the film. And if any uh, one of you has been to Mandu, you have, okay. <laughs> so it's very much inspired. Uh, actually, my first visit over there, which was uh, not from college because I was not uh, doing architecture much later, uh, it was very inspiring when I uh, went to that place. And for uh, this was much before I made the film. And when I went there, I knew for certain that this is a place that seems to come alive when you uh, go in, uh, when you travel through the architecture. One beautiful thing about uh, Mandu is it is not very commercial. There are not too many tourists. Few local tourists on Saturday, Sundays or whatever. But the the stories and the space is is so beautiful that it, it seemed to me like, you know, I could see what was happening centuries ago in those places. So it became a fascination for me that if I ever do a film, I want to uh, make this space come alive. And a lot of my stories come, up, come out like this. When I wish to do, uh, wish to uh, make a place come alive, it comes into my uh, story. So this, of course, uh, I mean, unknowingly, in a lot of uh, ways, it, it talks about the, uh, the matchbox existence within a city as contrasted with a much different existence when you go out of the city and when you go back in time. Uh, the way spaces were constructed centuries before was taking into consideration a lot of uh, details. Whereas now it is, I mean, you all know it, that there are different reasons why we construct houses and stay in them. So this was um, one of the films which traveled to a lot of festivals. It gave me a lot of exposure. I, tra I also traveled a little bit with it. And uh, it made me much more aware of what I was doing in, in terms of uh, animation. So after this um, film, I worked on uh, a feature film, which uh, sadly because of uh, lack of finances, we could never complete the film. But I worked for about six months with a small team of animators, 12 animators, um, for, about six, yeah, for about six months. This was way back in 2009. We never completed the film, of course. But in that six months, because six months is very little for uh, animation, the kind of work I do. It was a two and a half year long project. So in six months, what we did have was about four and a half or five minutes of animation, which I kind of put together. And it's it's like a trailer, which I would like to show you, but it's not really a trailer because you can't understand what happened. It doesn't indicate what the film is going to be about. It was just the animation that we had done, we put together. Now this film is also um, happens, I mean, this. The, the final feature film happens in three uh, different places and a fourth place that is Bombay. It, it's a story about three people, three migrants, young people, who have migrated from different places in India. One is Karnataka, one is Madhya Pradesh and one is Kashmir into a city like Bombay. And it's the story of these three individuals going back and forth between Bombay and the places that they come from. It's a very short uh, five minute Clip. But again, it's interesting because it's three different spaces altogether. Then. 
you'd be seen. <clears throat>
So anyway, this is what I do, not for a living, uh, this is what I do as a hobby. <laughs> and um, yeah, so this is animation, the, the way I do it, which is painted frame by frame and things like that. So more than me talking about my work, uh, I think it would be nice if we just open it out to a discussion, some questions which anybody has, but I can uh, elaborate on those issues because I would know what are your concerns more than you know, just keep talking about how I make these films. So please uh, feel free and like start. I mean, anybody has any comments also, questions, anything? We just we can pass around this mic on you, no? Okay. So, very, wow, very silent. <laughs> you're still reacting to the film or you're feeling shy? <laughs> okay, this was not the lively audience at the beginning of the talk. I hope the films have not <laughs> depressed you or anything. No, but I'm glad it, uh, it makes an effect. Right, ma'am, uh, why, yeah. why did you choose to not put any audio? Uh, audio, you mean voices? Yeah, voices, voices. Uh, I essentially uh, like telling stories through paintings, moving paintings, and I uh, don't feel the need for voices. It's also that when you don't, when you avoid voices, you try to tell a story through pictures, through visuals. And I've always been interested in painting as a, a, a medium of expression. And animation to me is actually moving these paintings to tell a story. So the more and more I've been doing animation, the more I feel the less or no voices that I use, my visuals become more communicative. So I have, I, I think it's also more poetic to say, uh, to say things without using voices. In animation, in fact, I have a problem when I hear uh, voices on uh, characters. Uh, sometimes it's like when you read a book and the characters have their own voices, but when you see them in a film, the voice doesn't match, or the look, or the way they move doesn't match, because it's your imagination which is creating and filling up the gaps. So I like to make a film where the audience is using their imagination. You will hear their voices in your mind, but they need not speak to each other. And in the last film, and in the other film, uh, the relationship is such that it's almost a wordless relationship between two people, or between a woman and a cat, or between a boy and a girl. So the further I bring down the voices, the more um, the audience is going to look at the images, the more the audience is going to hear the sounds which surround it. I mean, that's what I hope to do. So. And that's something you can do in animation. You, it's very difficult to do this in live action because people miss uh, voices in uh, live action. But in animation, a lot of people, especially when they do personal animation, it's almost always done without voices. I mean, I'm not talking about Disney, Pixar, and, uh, but the unconventional, personal, artistic animation. Yeah, the extent sound plays a very important role, right? I mean, you can sense that they're noisy, that's in the Bombay scene. Yeah. So, even the voice is not important, sound is important too. In fact, sound, yeah, I almost use sound uh, as opposed to voices to create emotions, to create moods, and uh, especially in this film, I've used the noisiness of uh, Bombay where, you know, two people can be talking but can't hear each other. I mean, especially in a place like Juhu where I have set the film, it happens often that you might be talking and can't hear each other. There's a chopper which goes and things like that. So I've lived in that place and I realized noise is a, is a, has a huge character. And it was very challenging to uh, do sound for this film because, uh, I mean, I had excellent sound designers. Uh, P.M. Satish, who's a national award-winning sound designer. The trouble was how to create silence. If the entire film is happening in Juhu, we still need silence in the film. So it was done really, I mean, we put a lot of thought into uh, making it noisy and yet at times giving a, giving a breather. The sound is actually 50-50% of the film, you know, now it's like half of the film is a visual and the sound which makes you look at the visual in a certain way. So that's very interesting about animation. It comes without any source sound, unlike live action films. Whatever sound you put onto it will make you look at the visual differently. So if you have a, a, a scene of a rose falling and you put a sound of a metallic thing, that rose suddenly will seem like it is a metal rose. 
So it's really like uh, you can play around with sound a lot, and I've played around with sound. It's like it's good fun to do. Uh, that's a very interesting question because uh, it should come together but because I uh, have not studied animation, I kind of learnt it by myself. The first film that I made, Printed Rainbow, I was not thinking sound at all. I was just thinking visuals and after I finished my film, I went to my sound designer and said, let's do sound. After having done Printed Rainbow and seen how much sound uh, influences the film, my later works began, uh, I mean, in, in my later works, I started thinking of sound while I was doing the animation. But of course, I would never do the sound. I would think about what the sound would be. And then uh, when I did uh, True Love Story, I had sound a lot in my mind. The songs, the, the last uh, fire dance which happens, that was, I got the music, I got the rights for the music, you know, and then I animated uh, to the music because these are all non-funded films, so buying rights and all is difficult. So even the Kajrare number and this was music that I thought was always going to be in the film, then I animated to it. There's a lot of imagery which we can relate to because we know the context. How do your foreign audiences react to it? See, uh, it's like when we watch Polish films or Italian films or Swedish films, we still relate to uh, how things would be over there. And now it's become much easier. Like Printed Rainbow, which was in 2006, was still, I had an audience which uh, had an idea about India, but had never visited India, but they got a uh, better idea about what it is through that film. But now the way people have seen films and they're exposed to Indian films just about everywhere, for them, it works at a level that it's, it's like uh, when I see a Fateh Akin movie, which is in Turkey and Germany. I've never been to Turkey, I've never been to Germany, but it works for me because the, set, the whole film is set up in such a way that you know what comes where. So even my storytelling is like, even if you don't understand the nuances of it, of, uh, these are nuances which you understand because you are a Bombayite. But if you are not, then also it gives you a glimpse of what Bombay must be. If the story still works, the plot still works at a level that their love story keeps the story going. So a person who does not know Bombay inside out doesn't lose out on another level of the story. But who knows Bombay gets an ex additional uh, take from it. So uh, the true love story also premiered in Cannes. And uh, nobody had, the thing is, when you uh, see films in a festival, they all come from very different places. And each of these films gives you a glimpse of that place. So you almost come back after a day's viewing, feeling you've visited uh, various places. So this film kind of does that. There were really no questions of, is this how it happens in Bombay or whatever. Uh, I was looking at when architecture also, we try to get the timelessness of, of a space. So irrespective of uh, where your kind of background is, you kind yeah. of can relate to it. So is that something which is uh, always coming up in your mind in some sense? Or to capture the essence of what you're trying to say rather than the... the Absolutely. Uh, like for me, um, uh, when I use a space in my film, I don't go and take photographs or, you know, take a YouTube um, reference. I have to go there, feel the space, spend some time in that space and get the feeling, the sound and all of it. And then I come back and use the same uh, photographs and things like that. This is what uh, some, like when Ajit Rao was teaching us and when he does exercises with us, uh, he used to teach us that a space is not the mathematics and the grid and of construction. It is what you feel when you enter that space. And this can be theoretically put all the time. But when you forget all the theory and you feel it yourself, then it comes into you. And somehow I've been more instinctive in the way I learn uh, uh, about things than uh, theoretical. So I, it has been there, but it has been nurtured through other people and uh, a bit of conscious, uh, uh, put, I mean, consciousness myself. But when I go to make a film, I don't really think it should appeal to a person who doesn't know this space at all and things like that. Somewhere you just take everything, you make it your own, and then you uh, create the work. Of course, it took me time. In the beginning, I couldn't do this. Now it's become easier for me to assimilate things and let it flow easily. So when I work with students also, that's what I tell them. Don't be very conscious that, you know, this, 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 this should be there. Keep that as an exercise, but try and imbibe it. Besides the theory, there is an instinct which works. 
it's, a, it's, it's very tough when you're uh, doing your first film. It gets easier and it's very tough to explain also how it uh, works. But yeah, I, I try and keep it. If it comes across, I'm very happy. If it doesn't, it's like... But yeah, I like people to... For me, the biggest compliments are we felt we were in Bombay for these 19 minutes. If that's a big compliment for me in the sense if I can transform somebody into another space for a little while and into somebody's little life for that 19 minutes, then that's what a film is supposed to do. Bombay, when, uh, and my grandparents then shifted uh, back to uh, one in Karnataka and one in uh, Gujarat and we used to go back. This, it was, this was also a reason why I, uh, these were my concerns in the film, that when you leave a place and come, the memories that you have and uh, you know they're almost romanticized when you come, especially to a place like Bombay. So for me also it was listening to my mother, my grandmother, my grandparents, even older people who were who run chai shops and things like that, who would always be talking about how it is back home. Even if it is not really, you know, that grand. So those, yeah, those were uh, my concerns when I was uh, making the film. And the film, uh, Printed Rainbow especially, has worked very well with uh, old people. Uh, and, I mean, it works for, with children also, really small children. But old people because uh, somehow they just realize this loneliness has been captured. Uh, quite well in the film and I felt the fact just that I set her up in a uh, in an apartment in a flat where there's already a distance which happens between people the loneliness is quite uh, apparent without you know spelling it out her loneliness seems to be I mean you you seem to feel her loneliness because it becomes a pattern how you spend a day you do the same thing again and again and again and that itself um, in a small space that itself terms loneliness so, and some, uh, um, I, I got an email which was very touching when I just made the film from somebody in uh, Korea who had seen the film and she said, I lost my grandmother, I was with her in the hospital and uh, I, after I watched her film, it made me feel like, you know, she's in some place nice. So it was comforting, you know, in, sen in a sense. And that was a lot because I, I was not making the film so seriously. But people took something very hopeful from it, like when a grandmother, grandmother passes away, in, inevitably she has to pass away. Uh, the end like this made her feel like, you know, okay, she's gone to another place. And even for a little while you want to cheat yourself or you want to feel that she's in a better place. It's like, you know, she's become a star kind of a thing. So it, it worked for uh, people uh, to deal with the loss and people who are alone or like I had shown this in an old old age home and they said it's so nice that somebody is actually dealing with loneliness which is for them a big big concern and they feel they're not there that loneliness is forgotten in the hustle bustle of the city so they felt it's it's nice that somebody is like actually addressing it so I didn't do these things consciously but uh, it's just that if you do something honestly then you kind of capture a lot of sentiments which people will uh, relate to so yeah, grand, in, with your age group, it's uh, grandmothers. Actually, this is my mother <laughs> that I uh, made her a little older and she's still alive. The cat is not alive, <laughs> but my mother is. So uh, it's, the rest is all uh, a story around the characters. Yes, yes. It's not a silly question. <laughs> no, it's not a silly question. It, uh, yes. He, uh, the, the, in True Love Story, the boy is Salim and the girl is Kamla and uh, it's not really necessary to name your characters, you can write a script without but for me and um, in, in a lot of ways, like I tell my students also, you have to know their name, their star sign, their uh, where did they come from, their histories and all this 
so that that person becomes like a friend to you. And you cannot have a friend whose name you do not know. If you have a person as a friend and then you start animating that person, then there is a lot more life that goes into them. So the cat also has a name, the old woman also has a name because she's like my mom. Uh, but yes, all my characters uh, do have names. What is the cat's name? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, the, I have had 26 cats in my life uh, and she has the most... And we ran out of names because we were very creative in the earlier names. I mean, I was because I used to keep bringing them in. So this one, when she came, we thought it was a male. And it, we had very serious names like, uh, I was reading Brothers Karmazov at that time. I was some 16, 17 years old and I had called them Alyosha, Mitya, um, Ivan. And then this one came, so she was called Chotu. <laughs> Because there was no names left and all the big names were taken and all. She stayed with my mother for 14 years and uh, she was a female but we never could change it to Choti because she started responding to Chotu. So she's not small at all. She was the biggest, fattest cat we had but she was called Chotu. <laughs> my mother's name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we go to a lot of study trips where we actually uh, document spaces through measuring them but in where you actually capture the essence of the space and uh, how you feel in that space. So do you think the motion pictures could actually be used as a medium to document those spaces, uh, especially the structures which are less documented or visited? Uh, see, not uh, animation films, no, because none, none of the geometry in my films are correct. Uh, not really geometry, but... Uh -huh. Uh, again, yes and no, because uh, this is still created. Uh, when you come to documentation, documentation is for you to be able to uh, understand what it really is and then for you to be able to take off. So when I do my documentation also, there would be real photographs. And then I spin off and I make this. So this cannot be used as documentation because nothing is precise. If you have, uh, I mean, if you have been to uh, Mandu, it's not really accurate. The lotus pond is on the ground floor and I've shown it on the first floor. So I've cheated. There is another uh, pond but not exactly the same space. So this is not, but the feel of this a place has got very little to do with the accuracy of a place. But that accuracy, it's, it's the same as when we do uh, animation, we have principles of motion which we have to learn and very accurately follow. For us that is the documentation. And we have to do that very precisely. Once having done that, then you go on to breaking those rules and making your own uh, interpretation. Now that interpretation can never be used by another animator saying this, these are the rules because that would be wrong. That is an interpretation, that is where you take off from the rules. So documentation will always be going and measuring the space and see, f measuring the space might sound very boring, but when you're measuring the space, like I'll tell you for example, it's like uh, I don't have a maid at home, I sweep and swap the house myself. The day I started doing this, I realized I understood my house and the floor and the wall and every little space over a period of you know sweeping and uh, it's like measuring it, it's like going through every space over a period of a few weeks. And I realized I understood my house so much better by just seeing those little, little corners which you don't see when you're living in that space. So measuring is, is that kind of an exercise that you spend time in that place, you understand that space through geometry, through numbers. But when you have done that and you come out, you'll have a feel of that space unconsciously coming inside you through an exercise. If somebody says, go inside and feel the space, you will go and talk on your phone or whatever, you know, do some Facebook and all that, come back and say, I felt the space. No, but when you're asked to go and measure something, invariably that place, ka feel, will come into you. So it's an exercise which should be done. The benefits of it you will know later on. But it, cannot, it can never be done through a YouTube or someone else's work. That's where you have to do it hands-on.
of your films, uh, the first one wherein the, like the, there is a certain projection of the character into different films to which he transcends to space and time, say, be it the palace or be it the unicorn on that truck that, you know, comes out of the frame and sort of flies out. So, that kind of visual uh, projection of the self into these different places, is it what drawing enables you? Uh, is it is it something which is complemented by drawing, or is it something that you like purposely want to do through your animation film? Because like uh, like because like we all have seen certain movies wherein like there is a particular <coughs> fake reality that I I want to do, but since since my body is physical, like it's like a human body, and maybe those animations do not gel up with something which is flesh and bone. However, drawing and animating actually brings. Or two stories together, but they are the same medium. So it much it is much more believable when you show the grandmother hobbling into these different yeah. uh, forests and landscapes. Yeah, see, this is one um, uh, characteristic of animation, especially 2D painted animation, which is not there in reality, which is not there in simulated reality, which is 3D animation or the fantasy films that you see. Those are uh, take so much uh, uh, depend so much on reality that. That fantasy, I mean, fantasy and reality is, is the more real you can be, the more your fantasy works. Whereas, when I get into painting, I mean, if you look at the, look at this as paintings which move, paintings have always been a, a place where uh, you can express dreams. The surreal pa painting movement which happened, or the, uh, yeah, basically, or the neorealist. It's where you can talk about dreams, you can talk about, un, uh, you know, chartered spaces, create those spaces and the, and the uh, spectator who's watching that painting is drawn in. So painting through the history of time has been looked at very differently from realism, from a photograph or from things which actually exist. So a human being in uh, painting can be very, very real but can do things which are not absolutely real. But then you know it is the painter's wish to show this kind of a uh, feeling from the uh, character. So. There is a freedom in painting, and that freedom I use when I use when I do animation, like weight. Weight is something which comes, which is a very real thing. So weightlessness is then a fantasy. It's not really a fantasy. It's a dream. It's so I don't hover on the level of um, like the, the Pixar or um, uh, DreamWorks films where that weightlessness is something else altogether. I still work within the canvas of what can be real, what can be a dream and they will, all this will happen only in their dreams. In their reality, they are stuck to their uh, reality. They will never fly. So my films, in that sense, which is what I said at the beginning, they are not absolute fantasy films, neither are they absolutely real films. Because the medium allows me to, I like to get into something like uh, dreams, which a lot of animators do in different ways. And that's why it's very interesting as a medium. It has its special uh, way of expression, which no other uh, medium has. So, yeah, you can uh, get away with murder in uh, uh, animation, and yet nobody feels bad, you know, I mean, in the sense, yeah, you feel bad, the, the, the character dies, but then, in a way, it's, it's not real, but it can be very real, how you look at it. So, yeah, nobody goes into a matchbox and is still alive, but you would like to believe that. It's like storybooks, it's like fables. You want to believe that. Even as a grown-up person, when you see a person flying in a, in a Russian fairy tale book, you believe it. And those paintings, which, those illustrations which are there, they, they let you believe it. So it's got, a, it's got a nice dream zone where you can move around. Yeah. yeah, because the last one actually is a feature film, which I could not uh, make. And it's just, that's what I meant. It's a completely different film. It's dealing with very different uh, issues. It's, it's not really uh, the medium of animation which I'm exploring the way I did uh, with Printed Rainbow. And True Love Story is really not like that at all. In fact, that is more like making a documentary film in animation, which is right now my uh, preoccupation. So this was supposed to be a feature film and, they, and has uh, narrative and voices but I didn't uh, find the funding to make the feature film and I was getting impatient so I took one story 
out of three stories and I made it made that into a short film. So it's constructed very, very differently. Almost interesting there in the last one, uh, like all our poster art, which is a The entire film, I mean, there is very small amount of uh, the film which happens on screen in the short film, but in the feature film, the film which happens on screen is completely done in the poster art style. And of course, I needed, needed budget, I needed uh, people to work on. So the idea was that, but I couldn't uh, execute it the way I wanted to. But I'm still following it, so hopefully it will happen. Uh, is, there a, is there a certain amount of research or survey that goes into uh, knowing the actual aspirations and uh, dreams of the people who are in the film, the kind of people that you are taking inspiration from? Because you are taking these films abroad and so what they know of India would be this, right? So, uh, what no, I'm not uh, an ambassador of uh, India that is supposed to uh, go and give a talk on how many people there. No, see films are essentially an artistic uh, expression of one person. If the film goes to festivals and people are looking at it, that does not mean the film has to give very accurate uh, uh, survey, I mean, does not have to give very accurate uh, idea. But I feel my films still are more accurate than, uh, say, um, um, or, I mean, a lot of Bollywood films which do go uh, abroad, and that is the idea people are having about what aspirations of the Indian mindset is right now. That I'm trying to break through a film like this. The thing is, surveys, no. But life, dealing with people, having friends, talking to people, knowing a few people, that has been my uh, research. That has been, now I wouldn't really call it research, but that's been my life experience. And wanting to tell, uh, because I've been like 20 years traveling all over Bombay, be it uh, in a local train or um, in a rickshaw or traffic stall. You meet all these people, you meet the girls who sell these gajras and all, you talk to them or chaiwalas or people who sell flowers and so for me it's been talking, engaging, knowing them, dealing with them, working with them and then wanting to tell their stories. So I wouldn't call it research and survey but I would call it, uh, yeah, I would not tell a story of somebody who I didn't know at all. Like I, I could probably not tell a story of um, um, a corporate banker as easily as I can tell the story because not that I'm, I'm not interested in it, but if I was interested in it, then I would really have to be in that world, spend time with them, uh, know for years together how they live and what they do, and then get it down to a film. Uh, 